okay. Well, by 2003, uh, Operation Black Biscuit concluded. You guys had spent a million dollars, and after everything was unsealed, uh, 55 Hells Angels members and associates were arrested. Uh, 16 were charged with RICO, right? Yes, sir, that's correct. Leading up to actually arresting everyone, how nervous were you? Because here you were associating with these guys and you were staying at their house, they were staying at your house, you know, while you were having a family this whole time because you had a wife and two kids, right? I did, you know, and, and the, um, the tiger doesn't change its stripes. You know, these guys are violent people. Uh, these dudes are some of the baddest cats on the planet. Um, I knew they were going to be pissed off. Uh, it, it was expected. I would have been shocked if they weren't. Um, uh, murder contracts were issued against me, death and violence threats against me and my family. Um, that, that to some extent was anticipated. Um, and you know what, it, it, man, I, I made, I made friends during that process or, uh, like built trust and built loyalty in some cases built love. And then I ultimately betrayed that, uh, for my job. And anybody that's been betrayed, anybody that knows what that feels like, um, you know, that, that creates anger and resentment. So, uh, the, the, the threats that came and that were inspired, uh, by the Hells Angels, to some extent, were anticipated. Okay. And because of that situation, you actually had money on your head uh, by the Hells Angels, the Aryan Brotherhood, and MS-13. Well, the murder contract started bouncing around, and um, the information came in uh, to me like, dude, you've been greenlit, um, and we don't know where it's coming from. But there's a lot of different people that are, that are interested in figuring out where you're at and, and getting their hands on you. Okay, how big was that contract on your head? You know what? I don't know that I ever heard like what the what the price tag was. Okay, but how did you feel when you heard about that? Well, it's unsettling. Um, I've seen firsthand, I, I, like I had direct knowledge of how violent they could be, um, how dangerous they could be. Um, so I didn't take any of that lightly. I, I definitely didn't fluff it off as just the cost of doing business. Um, I treated it. Uh, like the intelligence we were receiving, which was uh, credible and viable and valid and sanctioned, um, I believed it to be true. Okay. But at one point, ATF ended up basically unmasking your situation, uh, something called backstopping, which basically hides your license, your, you know, your residence, your driver's license, vehicle registration, everything else like that. And that's supposed to be in place for undercover agents. But at one point they took it away, which allowed you to be, you know, found out in a way, right? Well, it did. Um, uh, ATF doubled down on me probably four or five different times. The threats were um, confirmed as valid and ATF didn't investigate the threats. They didn't chase the threats down. Um, I wrote a, I wrote a book. I wrote that I was told I was on my own, that I had to protect myself. I wrote a book, uh, called No Angel, uh, which was designed to try to document the story and try to hide in plain sight. That was the only resource I had really available to me. Um, ATF sued me for the book. Um, I was on an airline flight. I was on a Southwest Airlines flight. Um, some Hells Angels were on the flight. I got in a full on fist fight with a couple Hells Angels on this commercial airliner. Um, no one no one bothered to follow up. No one cared who was involved or tried to investigate it. Um, when I complained about all that, ATF doubled down. They pulled all my backstopping. They pulled all the documents and the, um, uh, the mechanism that was used to hide uh, my, the, the location of my address and my vehicles and things like that. Uh, once they unmasked my, my cover documents and all my personal information was open source, three months after that, uh, in August of 2008, my house was burned to the ground by arsonists. Um, and I actually felt some relief uh, in that, in that I felt like now they can't ignore this anymore. They can't ignore these threats. And they doubled down on me again and built a task force with instructions to frame me 
as the arsonist of my own house. And in essence, what they were saying is that I was willing to murder my own family by a fire, and which led to lawsuits and trials and just uh, like a, a really sad uh, ending, at least sad for me, to my career. Right, because your wife and two kids were inside that house when it got set on fire. Well, all the evidence is, is that they uh, were surveilling the house and waited for me to leave. I was gone. I was actually out of town uh, when the fire happened. So, yes, my wife and my kids were home, um, and they narrowly escaped with, with – they had some smoke inhalation uh, injuries, but uh, we lost everything. I mean, it, like, when I say everything, we lost everything. Okay, and they try to say that you're the one who set the house on fire? Well, I was working at that time. Uh, the, the management structure over me at ATF was a perfect storm of uh, incompetence and arrogance and negligence, uh, guys with retaliatory mentalities and like who were basically corrupt and criminals. Um, the same people that designed this plan to frame me as the arsonist were the same people that were running ATF's Operation Fast and Furious, where they allowed thousands of guns to be trafficked uh, into Mexico right under their nose that they knew were landing, you know, with the cartels. That is how these people that were supervising me and my managers, that, that's how they were managing. That's how they were, th that's how they were operating as federal agents. Okay. Do you know who set your house on fire? I do not. Um, there were uh, some some really strong leads, real time leads, that led in several different directions that were credible, viable leads that ATF chose to ignore when they were trying to build the case against me. Right. Ultimately, you ended up suing the ATF or, or different organizations. Well, I sued ATF. Um, and ultimately, the Department of Justice, which ATF is an agency underneath or a part of. Um, so um, that in itself was its own adventure, man. When you're just one guy with one attorney and you're taking on the Department of Justice, um, man, like they out-resource you, they outman you. Um, and then, you know, we went to trial on this case. Uh, DOJ lied, cheated, and stole, and played every dirty trick you can imagine, um, and they still lost all the allegations, all the all the complaints that I made, all of them, every one of them was proven true in a federal courtroom. Okay, but ultimately you lost, you know, after the you know because there was an appeal, I think at so at some point, and what what ultimately happened with all these cases? Yeah, so I, I won on the facts and evidence in the trial court. DOJ appealed the victory, and the appellate court said the appellate court did not touch the facts and evidence. They did not dispute any of the things that had been found out and proven at the trial court. All they said was that ATF did not have an obligation to investigate the threats or protect me. And so really my complaints in the eyes of the appellate court were not valid, regardless of what happened. 